Hello everybody, in this video I'm going to show you how to bypass or disable the carbon monoxide sensor in your Furman generator. I have a Furman model WH03242, but the same procedure should work for other models too. If it does or doesn't work for you, please leave a comment to help other people. First, I need to say that I am not recommending that anybody do this to your generator. Carbon monoxide is a dangerous gas that kills hundreds of people every year. It is odorless and can knock you out and kill you before you even know what's happening. It is extremely important that you keep the fumes from your generator away from any occupied spaces. That said, many people have complaints that wind will trip the CO sensor in error, or maybe you built a box around the generator to keep the noise down and now it won't run. Those are valid complaints, but just make sure you know the dangers of CO poisoning first and proceed at your own risk. I am providing information, not advice. So let's get into it. First, we need to locate the carbon monoxide sensor on your generator. On mine, it is under this vented panel at the back by the wheels. If your generator looks different, find where the exhaust comes out and then look on the opposite corner. The sensor should be on the opposite side from the exhaust, usually tucked up behind the control panel somewhere. Let's remove the six screws holding the cover on, and then you should see the sensor with a barcode up at the top right corner. Remove the one screw holding it in, and then carefully pull it down so you don't rip any wires out. Unfortunately, you can't just disconnect these wires. The engine won't run without the sensor connected. So I'm going to show you four different methods to bypass or disable it. Method number one is to tape it. So first carefully disconnect the wiring plug from the top of the module. If you look around the outside of the module, you'll see three sets of vents to allow air into the, into the case. You could put tape over these vents, but if you look close, you'll see there are also gaps around the white plug that could leak CO into the module. So to get it open, remove the two tiny screws on the end. After those are removed, there are two clips along the sides, so you'll need to push your thumbnail or something similar into the crack to get the two sides to separate. Once you have the circuit board out of the case, you'll see a component with a white circle on top. That white circle is the membrane for the actual CO sensor. So if you cover it with tape, you'll prevent the CO from getting into the sensor. After you have it covered with tape, just reassemble everything you took apart. Now I need to say that in my testing, this method was not 100% effective. It seemed to make the sensor a lot less sensitive, which may be exactly what you want but it did not completely disable it. That probably depends on what kind of tape you use and how good of a job you do and how long the adhesive holds up over time. So let's move on to method number two, which is to jump it. One thing that the sensor is doing in normal operation is providing signal to the TCI unit, which controls the ignition. So we can jump those wires manually to trick the system into thinking the sensor is there. With the sensor removed, you can get a good look at the wiring harness that you disconnected. On my generator, the important wires are the green and the yellow wire that are right next to each other. There's actually a second yellow wire and also another green and yellow striped wire as well, so you have to be careful to get the right two wires. I've looked at the wiring diagram for some other Furman models, uh, and those sometimes use two black wires for the same function instead of green and yellow, so just be aware that the colors could vary. There should, they should always be right next to each other at the front of the connector, though. Once we've identified the correct wires, we need to jump them. The easiest way I've found is by sticking a paper clip up the end of the plug. The smaller size of paper clip seems to be the perfect gauge to fit in the end without damaging the connectors. The larger ones you could force in there, but it did cause some damage, it seemed like. Either way, you'll probably want to wrap it with electrical tape so that it stays put with the generator vibrating while it's running. Once jumped, the generator should run normally without the CO module even connected. One thing to note is that my generator has electric start, but it does not have remote start. And according to the wiring diagram, the remote start module does add an extra blue wire to the CO module. So if your generator has remote start, I really don't know if it's going to require jumping that blue wire as well or not. So let me know in the comments if you can get it working. So those first two methods, taping it or jumping it, are probably the best methods because both are easily reversible if you want to sell the generator later or if you need to send it in for warranty repair or something. Um, but what if you don't have tape or paperclip handy? 
So method number three would be to snip it or cut it. We know that the CO module uh, passes the signal from the ignition circuit in order for the engine to run, but when it senses CO, it actually isn't breaking that connection. Instead, what it's doing is that the module is grounding the ignition out in order to make the generator stop. So if we remove the module's access to ground, it no longer has the ability to shut the generator down, even if it senses carbon monoxide. So this is as simple as finding the yellow and green striped wire, that'll be the ground wire in the plug, and just cutting it. Make sure you only cut that one wire though, because the others can still, if you disconnect the brown wire, for instance, the generator will still um, throw an error code and shut down. This is the quickest and easiest method, but it's also the hardest to reverse if you should need to. Personally, I didn't want to permanently disable my module. I just wanted to be able to easily turn it off if it's not working how I want it to. So method number four would be to switch it. Instead of just cutting that ground wire and leaving it disconnected, you can put a switch on it so it's easy to disable or re-enable the CO module whenever you want. This sounds simple, and it is, uh, but if you want to put that switch on the front panel, uh, it takes a lot more disassembly just to get access to that front panel. So I'm not going to give super detailed instructions on this, um, just an overview and a few tips in case you want to try it yourself. So first you'll need to take off the top panel and then remove the gas tank. Then remove the six screws around the front panel and the screw holding the gas propane switch on. Once you have those off, you'll be able to see on the inside there's a bracket holding the choke lever and the propane port. With that disconnected, you may still have to cut some zip ties in order to actually pull the control panel away um, from the body of the generator to get access to it, which you'll need to do in order to remove this plastic shield that covers all the wiring. With everything disconnected, you'll see this green and yellow wire with a splice in it that goes to the ground lug on the front panel. This is the other end of the ground wire from the CO module, so that's what you'll need to cut to uh, interrupt it with a switch. You'll want to be careful where you drill the hole for the switch because there's a lot of stuff hidden on the back of the control panel that you can't see from the front. I originally wanted to put it in the open yellow spot just to the right of the CO alert light, but there's actually an important module right behind there, so instead I drilled over here on the left side of the CO Alert logo. I chose a rocker switch with an LED light, which added extra complexity. You would think there are a lot of 12 volt sources I could tie into, but the 12 volt outlets for the generator actually don't share the same ground with the CO module. The alternative would be to tie it in directly to the battery, but I didn't want to do that because I didn't want the light wearing down my battery if I forgot to disconnect it. I found the white oil level sensor wire at the top of the main power switch here carries about 5 volts and it's only on when the generator is running, so I tied into that. The LED indicator on my switch is a little dim because it's only getting 5 volt instead of 12 volt, but looking at my options, it was the best compromise in my opinion. Buying a switch without an LED indicator would make it much simpler. So those are the four methods. I was able to figure out most of this because Furman publishes great wiring diagrams in their user manuals, which some brands do not. Uh, if you have a different Furman model um, and my instructions aren't working, try looking at the wiring diagram to see if you can figure out how to adjust my instructions. Please leave a comment if this does or doesn't work for you and which method you tried. I can't promise I'll be able to fix it, but I'm interested to hear how it works. Thanks.